Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Decred in Depth Live. Thank you guys for tuning in this beautiful Monday morning here in Oklahoma. I have a very special guest with me today. Um, without further ado, Mateus De Giovanni. Hello. Hello, hello. Welcome. Good morning to you. Thank you. Good morning. Very excited to have you on. Jump right into this, Mateus. You need no introduction. Um, we're going to talk a lot today about the you know, decentralized treasury and the three new op codes. Um, but before we do, I want to be able to talk to you a little bit about you know, the upgrade mechanics. And we had a lot of questions from the Decred community uh, on Twitter. A lot of people interested in learning a little bit more about uh, Lightning Network and ticket splitting and some of your thoughts around that. But um, at a high level, uh, walk us through the mechanics of a consensus vote upgrade from writing up the code to the code being reviewed to merger. Okay, so uh, the, the rough process for, uh, for performing a, an on-chain or a consensus upgrade is first uh, someone is going to have an idea <laughs> about some feature that they want to implement or they want to have working on the chain. Then that idea is going to be discussed on some informal uh, informal forums or on Reddit or on the chats. And that's going to form the basis for a Politea proposal. So this proposal is going to be put to a vote and is going to establish a budget, uh, a rough timeline and a rough spec for the consensus changes, for the set of consensus changes. After that goes to a vote and hopefully approved in Politea, uh, the actual work of coding the change is going to take place. So that's just the regular standard uh, development work where uh, the, the developers are going to write the code, uh, the code is going to get reviewed by the, the the other developers, the general community, uh, it's going to get merged, and that is going to generate a new software release, which for the treasury work was version 1.60. After that, uh, that or concurrent to that uh, upgrade, we write a, a full spec for the feature, which is a DCP, a, a Decred Consensus Proposal. Uh, or decred change proposal and that tcp is going to to very clearly define how the feature is going to work so it's going to have all the technical details necessary for uh, a different implementation uh, for example if we had we don't have that yet but if we had a, a, a different node written in a different language that spec would be used to also implement the same change on a different node. So after the, the full spec and after the work, uh, the code is fully uh, merged, that goes for uh, and released. The miners and the stakeholders have some time to upgrade their, their running nodes for the new release. So that's the first time that, or the second time that miners and, and stakeholders have a chance to uh, decide whether they want that feature or not. So the first decision that they make in, is in funding the work on Politea. They have a second decision on whether to upgrade their nodes or not. And so presumably if they really, really didn't want that feature, they could simply uh, not upgrade, though that's usually the case since each, each release has a bunch of new features and improvements. And so after the upgrade, after both miners and stakeholders upgrade, we go through a, an on-chain voting process where the stakeholders are going to vote on whether to accept the new consensus rules or not. And so once the stakeholders uh, come to a decision, to a final decision, whether to approve or uh, disapprove this consensus upgrade, uh, assuming it's going to get approved, the new consensus rules are activated. So that's very high level rough process of upgrade. No, that was very clear. Um, thank you for that. What would happen if, say, the miners refuse to upgrade? 
so the the most immediate action that stakeholders can take is to not vote on blocks produced by miners that haven't upgraded. So that's what actually what uh, version 161 is going to do. It's going to refuse to vote on unupgraded blocks. So uh, since the stakeholders uh, decide that there's a good chance that this this new feature that that they want this new feature, uh, the stakeholders have a, a clear desire for this new feature since they are they have upgraded and they are upgrading to the new version. If the miners decide not to upgrade, then they are not going to get their Coinbase reward. So what are some of the bottlenecks, strengths, and weaknesses of Decred's consensus change process compared to other cryptocurrencies and open source projects in general? Uh, in terms of, of open source projects in general, Decred follows it very closely. So. Uh, all the code produced by Decred developers is open source, so it follows roughly the same uh, the same processes or uh, the same standards as uh, other open source product projects. Uh, uh, I think that the greatest uh, the greatest asset or the greatest strength or the the greatest. Uh, uh, feature for Decred's governance is that it has a formal process for, for reaching decisions. So it has a formal process to uh, come to a, a, a decision, a final decision on whether to activate or implement or, or uh, have some feature on the blockchain. So I think that's the, the greatest uh, asset. So I want to give a little bit of background uh, before I ask this question. Um, it was asked on Twitter um, whether someone wanted me to ask you whether you thought this uh, these series of opcodes took a long time to develop. And so I want to ask you just a little bit about your philosophy on software development um, in terms of balancing speed with care and precision, uh, especially when you talk about, you know, hybrid money softwares why is it so important that devs be you know careful and and thinking about the possible failures and attacks um and, and tell us a little bit about you know your philosophy on software development so uh i think there are different levels of uh of demand and different approaches that you need to take on different stages of the software or different layers of the software or different stacks so uh, you need to have a different approach for consensus level work and for consensus level code than you need for uh, higher level stuff like uh, uh, payment integration, for example. So while it's important to get a payment integration done correctly, it's easier to, for example, uh, upgrade a code that is running uh, your a payment gateway, for example, a centralized uh, payment gateway, for example, it's easier to upgrade or to, to shut it down or to fix problems than it is to uh, release a new version and have every participant of the network upgrade to a new version to fix a bug in consensus code, for example. So it's very important uh, to take different uh, approaches for different levels of the stack. Uh, specifically about consensus code that obviously needs to be the, the stricter code because you don't get many chances to upgrade uh, both miners and stakers and upgrading and uh, activating new rules, for example, is uh, it's not, it's probably not as uh, demanding as in Bitcoin, but it's just because the, the decreds uh, whole stack is prepared for regular upgrades. So it's probably not as, as traumatic as upgrading the Bitcoin network, uh, but still uh, some some work, it's still work. You need to go to all your miners, all the, the stakeholders need to upgrade. Uh, many nodes in the peer-to-peer -peer network need to be upgraded. So you don't wanna be doing that uh, every every other week, for example, you want to 
have a very stable release that you want to build off your other, other tools from. Uh, and so, for example, in the, the treasury work, uh, since it's, it, it's introducing a, a different abstraction now on the blockchain, on Decred's blockchain, uh, the treasury work is not based on UTXOs, it's based on an account model. So the treasury, the, the funds for the treasury aren't tracked in outputs, aren't tracked in UTXOs. Uh, they are tracked on a specific account on the blockchain, on the, the state of the blockchain. And so that presented a, a unique set of challenges to, to develop and to fix all the, the small bugs that creep, creep up. So for example, uh, we, had, we had plenty of off by one bugs. Uh, we had plenty of bugs or, uh, that uh, could, for example, lock up the chain if we didn't deal with them correctly. So this new model of accounting was very, very tricky to get right. So that's some of the reason for why it took so long to, to develop. Yeah. Um, and, and with all that being said, you know, uh, someone who's, I, I'm not a coder and, you know, work on consensus level development. In, in your opinion, do you feel like it took an appropriate amount of time? Was it too long? Or how do you feel about it? <laughs> that, that's a tough question. Uh, I mean, uh, in, a, in a general sense, it could always, everything could always be <laughs> faster. You know, if we didn't take weekends or had a crunch time or, uh, you know, if we had a more consensus level developers looking and working on this thing and testing this. Uh, and if we didn't have to, to juggle every other thing that we also have to juggle, yeah. uh, every yeah. other uh, work that we also have to do. So maybe it could be strictly a little bit faster. Uh, but I think it, it was done as it needed to be done. It was done carefully and it was done so that we don't have to have a an upgrade uh, a week after we release the code and yeah, figure yeah. out, oh, we forgot this small bug here that completely locks up the thing. Absolutely. And I, I want to be able to talk to you later about, you know, uh, attracting new devs and educating devs at the consensus level. Um, but before we jump into that, uh, what are you, generally speaking, how do you think uh, Decred has struck a balance in terms of the incentives of stakeholders and, and wanting developers to push out more and new features and quicker and faster, um, but then also, you know, sort of the, the necessity of making sure that devs are not treated like cattle and that we respect, you know, that these are human beings who have lives and, um, you know, just and, and give respect to the, the work and the difficulty that it takes. So how do you think that Decred hits that balance? So uh, I think that Decred is, is it's literally a, a new way of working for devs. It's, uh, and it's a new way for stakeholders in the general sense, not just Decred stakeholders, but uh, stakeholders in a project to, to have uh, a sort of balance of power among uh, developers, users, uh, and in the case of, of a blockchain project, miners, POW miners. And this, this incentive structure is very different. And, and it, we sometimes try to uh, relate the standard way of working uh, in a company with uh, a set of hours that you need to work and a set of goals that you need to reach at, at a certain date and at a certain uh, budget and so on. And it's sometimes not, uh, we're not, not exactly, Decred is not exactly that. It's not a, it's not a, exactly a, a standard, uh, standard company where you have a boss that gets to you and says, oh, okay, stop, drop all you're doing and, and start working on this thing right now because we need to ship to users uh, in, uh, in two weeks. Otherwise, user X is going to drop our contract and so on. So. It's a completely different way of, of working. Uh, sometimes, maybe there's a, uh, especially from non-developers, there's this perspective that development takes time. 
and that's sort of true everywhere. <laughs> Everyone that is not a developer has this perspective that development takes time. And everyone that is a developer usually uh, complains that they don't have enough time to develop the features they want with the appropriate care that they want. So I think that Decred, uh, at least for me as a developer, is an experiment in trying to get development right for, for all sides. So I think the, the incentive structure, the balance of power between the stakeholders that are going to ultimately uh, decide whether the developers are going to get paid or not. And this is a big part of the treasury work, you know, uh, trying to balance out the power between the developers and the stakeholders, the owners of the currency. Uh, that's a big part of the treasury work. So I think that uh, Decred is a, a, is a, a is a new thing. It's it's a it's a different thing that we are still trying to figure out how to balance all of these these competing demands. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. Um, I want to jump now into some of the nitty gritty of the op codes, the, the consensus changes that are being proposed. Um, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are three new op codes. Uh, T spend, uh, op tad, and op op T spend plus op T gen. Uh, what is an op code, and can you explain each of these at a high level for the audience? Okay, so the the op codes are the low level uh, the low level building blocks of smart uh, smart codes or smart programs. Uh, they are the 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 individual operations that. Uh, a script or uh, a program in the blockchain uses to do its job. So, for example, if you uh, pick uh, a standard uh, coin transfer, if you pick a standard coin transfer transaction, there is a small op code there called check seek, which uh, asserts that the given coin is owned by the given key, or in other words, that the given key has a has the right to spend some set of coins, so that's an op code. Op code is basically a small function in the smart code language for Decred. Uh, these new, three new op codes actually uh, they're not terribly magical. They 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 don't do a lot of work. Most of the work is actually done by the consensus rules of the blockchain. Uh, but they, these opcodes, they, they are used to mark or to identify the various types of transactions that interact with the new treasury. So you have an opcode that tells you, oh, this transaction is adding funds to the treasury, which is the TAD. You have an opcode that says uh, these, uh, this transaction is generating coins into the treasury, which is the TGEN. And you have the uh, the the T spend, which marks the transa transaction, saying this transaction is spending coins from the treasury. So the these op codes are used to mark the special uh, transactions. Uh, as I said, one of the the big changes of the treasury is that we we're not uh, the treasury is not. Uh, output based it's not utxo based it's account based so you need these special markers these special markers in transactions to deal with the treasury so there isn't a, a specific output saying oh the treasury now has x uh, amount of decrets in its funds that's an internal state of the blockchain you're just saying oh i'm i'm debiting uh, i'm spending x amount of decrets from the treasury, and that's marked by a T-spend. Why is T-spend so powerful? Uh, as I said, it's not that T-spend is so powerful. It's not uh, terribly complicated. It, it, it's used to mark that a given transaction is spending from the, from the treasury. 
Uh, the, the cool thing about this pen, I think, is that it's uh, it's not using the standard DCDSA signatures. It's using a Schnorr uh, signature, which is probably the first large scale use of Schnorr, uh, Schnorr signatures in the cred. And so that's a, that's an interesting bit of trivia for this pen. How much more participation from stakeholders will be required once the code is activated? Will stakeholders be required to review all the payouts each month, each month from the Treasury and vote on the payout, or will it be similar to voting on Politea? The, the process for, for paying from the Treasury is going to be slightly different now, but only slightly different, only a little bit different. So most of the steps are going to be similar to how it's been done for the past few months. Uh, the contractors are going to submit their invoices. Then there's going to be a, a domain-specific review of these invoices. So for example, in development, every developer can see uh, other developers' invoices. So we can do an initial review of each other's work. Uh, the, the DCC proposal actually lays out most of this. So the, according to the DCC, this is the first step, the, re, the in domain or within domain uh, review. After that, you can have an hour contractor review in case there are problems. So if there's an issue, if there's some conflict, uh, if a uh, developer is, or, or any contractor is trying to, to overview, for example, uh, you can have a no contractor review of the invoice. After that is settled, so the contractors have reached an agreement of the of a given month's uh, set of set of invoices, the, the whole picture of invoices, the whole set of invoices that is going to be built from the treasury. Uh, Polite is going to generate a treasury spend transaction, a T spend transaction, and then that's going up for review and voting on chain. So what contractors or what stakeholders are, are going to have to do is uh, either rely on the contractors for review or review the 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 T spend transaction itself. So they're going to have some so they're going to have to spend a little bit of time for reviewing the, the treasury. Obviously that, that review is going to be done by different stakeholders at different levels. So for example, if uh, I, I'm not really much of a marketing person, so I can't really uh, review in detail the, the marketing spends, but I have some idea of how much I think it's worth spending on marketing in, in a general sense. So if that specific, if a specific uh, treasury spend is trying to spend, overspend in the marketing that department, I can either raise uh, comments in Politea or I can raise comments in, in social media, in the chats or on Reddit or whatever. And other stakeholders can, can also do this sort of soft review of the treasury spend. And then the stakeholders are, are going to set the voting policy for their wallets. So you can set a, a policy for always approving or always rejecting uh, T-spends in general, or you can set a policy for individual T-spends. So for example, if I reviewed this month's, uh, this month's treasury spend transaction specifically, and I'm not satisfied for, with it, I can set my wallet to reject that specific treasury spend. So there's going to be some, some time that stakeholders are going to need to spend to do this sort of review and setting up their, their voting policy. So, so this question, this question that I'm about to ask was, is kind of off the, um, the list of pre-planned questions, but I'm kind of just now starting to understand this. And so I, I want to make sure that what I think I understand is clear. Um, so this new treasury account that's being created, the, the, the T-spend allows for all the treasury spends with this large-scale implementation of Schnorr to all be completely anonymous and untraceable? Uh, not, I'm not sure completely anonymous and untraceable is exactly right because 
the contractors aren't uh, exactly aren't entirely anonymous for sure uh, and, and so for example uh, if someone is reviewing my my invoices on polite if other developers are reviewing my invoices on polite they can reasonably accurately uh, determine which outputs are coming to me based on on for example how many hours or I work and the standard rates of billing so it's not exactly entirely anonymous and entirely untraceable but you can deal with that after the payment uh, by using mixing so you so for example contractors after they receive their payments they can mix their coins so after the payment itself happens you can sort of uh, achieve uh, some some protection or a lot of protection uh, added by the mixing against external observer uh, against external observers and against uh, other contractors uh, based on your spending on your spending patterns. So, for example, if I'm mixing my coins after I received my payments, uh, while there's a reasonable assumption while other developers or other contractors can have some idea of how much I've received. Uh, it's not so much, it's not as clear how much I'm spending, how much I'm staking and so on. So you have a, a lot more added privacy by combining the, the treasury spend transactions with mixing. I, uh, makes a lot of sense. So this was a question that came up on Twitter. Um, as a new contra, contractor I, i'm not actually able to answer this yet but maybe you could just explain to stakeholders um, as a contractor how do you get paid from the treasury like what's sort of on your your back end process how does that work well that's that's exactly the process that's pretty much today the exact same process as i described for when the the, the treasury is activated so you submit invoices those invoices are reviewed uh, the difference today is that the the transaction that that withdraw, withdraws from the treasury is not reviewed prior to being published, since the treasury isn't yet decentralized. So that 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 specific transaction is uh, done by by specific people, and it's signed by specific people by the holders of the the current treasury wallet keys uh, but other than that it's pretty similar to what i described for the decentralized treasury absolutely um, i want to transition now to talking a little bit about lightning network you you've done interviews in the past uh on decred in depth talking a lot about lightning and i encourage everyone to go watch those and i'll have those in the description but why is lightning network so important um and alongside that do you think lightning is overrated underrated or properly rated today uh, that, that's a that's a tough question because uh, different people are going to rate uh, lightning differently so i think that it's uh, lightning uh, or the, the concept of the lightning network as a second layer as a second level network as a second level scaling solution uh, is definitely definitely necessary uh, any any blockchain based on on the bitcoin idea of having a single uh, blockchain with limited on-chain capacity is going to need a second level solution for scaling uh, and that applies to decred as well so it's definitely something that is needed uh whether lightning as it currently is is uh is the solution for scaling i don't think it is as it is now i think there's a lot of improvements that are needed in lightning especially uh regarding what i call episodic wallets that is wallets that come online only for limited interaction with the lightning network lightning as it stands today is geared towards long-lived nodes 
So you put up your Lightning node and it's going to be online most of the time. Uh, so I think there's still a lot of a lot of improvements that are needed in the general architecture of Lightning. How will Lightning on Decred compare to Lightning on Bitcoin? Is Decred better suited for heavier Lightning usage? What are some obvious Lightning use cases on Decred? Thank you, Permeable Nino, for that question. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure it's more suited than, than Bitcoin's Lightning Network. Uh, Decred has also, has, uh, due, to, due to having staking, due to the staking capabilities of Decred, there are possible interactions between uh, Lightning Network and the staking subsystem that we haven't really explored yet. We, we don't yet know how staking is going to influence Lightning because uh, in, a, in a certain sense, Lightning for Bitcoin, for example, is a way for you to allocate your Bitcoin capital towards uh, having some useful thing happening in the network. So for example, if you're running a Lightning Hub node, you can allocate your capital your BTC to to grow your node and have more connections and, and earn routing fees from that capital that you're alloc allocating on the Lightning Network. Uh, on the other hand, since Decred has the staking, there's al already an assumption that if you are a long-term Decred user, you're probably putting your coins to work on staking. So in a certain sense, Lightning Decred's Lightning is competing with Decred staking for funds. So there's there, so that interaction isn't exactly clear yet how it's going to play out. I'm not sure whether that's going to increase Lightning's usage because Decred Lightning nodes may have to uh, ask for larger fees to offset the possible opportunity cost of not staking those coins. Uh, I'm not sure whether the, the light, Decred Lightning Hubs are going to be maybe more altruistic than Bitcoin's nodes, since, since the, the nodes don't really need to have so much, uh, since the nodes have an alternative in the form of staking. So, uh, so there's an interaction, there's an incentive structure there. There's a, an economic interaction that I'm not sure it's, it's really clear whether that's going to make Decred's Lightning larger or not. Uh, in that sense, one of the obvious use cases for Decred specific Lightning is for multi-owner tickets, uh, which I published uh, a set of, of, of posts last year about how uh, to, uh, trying to come up with a pre-solution or a general architecture or multi-owner tickets. So I think that we're going to see a lot of interaction between Lightning and the staking system. Uh, that's a great segue into the next question, which are what are some of the most exciting developments in the Lightning pipeline? So I think that the the most the most exciting development that I think it's uh, useful or that's going to be useful are PTLCs, which are uh, a different type of, of payment uh, mechanism in Lightning. Today, Lightning is entirely based on hash challenges. So you have, if you're the, if you want to receive a payment in Lightning, you generate uh, a random string, a random number, and you hash, you apply a hash into this number. And this hash is used to bind the payment across all nodes in the, from the sender to the receiver in the Lightning Network. PTLCs uh, use sort of the same con concept, but instead of a hash challenge, it's a, it's a, uh, a point challenge, uh, uh, an elliptic curve challenge. So instead of generating a random number and a hash challenge, you generate a, a random private key and you bind the payment to the, to the public key corresponding to that private key. And that allows a large number of interesting operations. You can build escrow operations in Lightning. You can build uh, decentralized 
oracles. You can build uh, decentralized uh, contracts in Lightning based on, on, on elliptic curve arithmetic or algebra or uh, math in general. <laughs> so that's a, a very interesting development that I think it's going to, to be able to show a lot of, of interesting use cases for Lightning. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, uh, some of that went over my head, but I, I, a use case that I'm very interested in, uh, and this is my own selfish question. Are you familiar with the game Light Night? It's like the Satoshi games and they're kind of building like a, a Halo version, but like you, you kind of like Halo, except you win Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. Are you familiar with this? Uh, uh, I'm familiar in passing. Uh, I've heard about it, but I, I haven't really looked too, too closely. Do you think anything like that is possible on Decred in the future? It's possible uh, the same way it's possible today. Uh, if it's possible on Bitcoin's Lightning Network, it's possible on Decred because they're very, very, uh, very closely related. The code is very closely related. The concepts are closely related. So pretty much anything that is possible on, on Bitcoin's network is possible on Decred's network. What I think it's probably going to happen uh, is that uh, we're going to have uh, cross coin payments uh, between the networks before necessarily having, uh, having Decred specific lightning applications. So I think that, uh, and this is one of the things that PTLCs help to do safely, which is cross coin payments. Uh, I think we're going to see that first, and before we have uh, Decred specific uh, Lightning applications. Well, what are your you, you have written posts about ticket splitting. Um, what are your thoughts about ticket splitting today? And do you think it's possible that um, ticket splitting could help drive lightning usage on Decred? You've kind of already answered that, but. Yes, uh, I've kind of answered that. But I think that, uh, so just to give a little, a little context on ticket splitting, since I've worked, I've been, I'm the one that worked on the original implementation. Uh, so it was pretty clear once we were working on version 1.6.0 that uh, ticket splitting as it was or as it is implemented today wouldn't work because there are several uh, architectural differences in the new uh, accountless ESP mode. So the, the multi-owner tickets need a new protocol, a new, uh, a new interaction mode with the wallet because the, the DCR wallet now has some some added uh, protections against external co uh, external clients connecting to it so there's going to to need some additional uh, it was clear while we were working on 160 that uh, the existing multi owner ticket or split ticket uh, client wouldn't work on v160 uh, and so I decided not to work immediately on it and try to work harder towards uh, bringing uh, multi-owner multi tickets to Lightning. So that's sort of what I've been uh, under the covers of darkness <laughs> and in my, in, in my, my little retreat I've been working working towards that, slowly working towards that, besides every other stuff that I need to do as well. Uh, but uh, since 1.6.0 has been released, there's been a steady increase in the, in the price, in Decred's price. So that's, that might change a little bit of my plans if uh, that continues for a bit longer because the, pr the the price of tickets now is very it's much larger than it was like three or four months ago Absolutely. so that might might prompt me to change a little bit my strategy absolutely um how can 
this is kind of moving off from Lightning Network, and there are some questions that are popping up in the chat. I'm, I'm sure you see those, or hopefully you do. And if we have time, maybe we can return to those at the end, but I think we've gotten to kind of most of them in some way or another. Turning now to attracting developers. Um, how can Decray continue to attract developers to work on DCR other than price go up? And what are your thoughts on educational program funded by the DAO geared towards edu uh, teaching people? So uh, I think that uh, the, I think that it's important that the the price. Uh, I, I think the most important thing about the price increase is that it allows us to allow the treasury to fund more work. So I think that's a positive thing. Uh, how to attract developers for a decentralized project, that's a, a tougher challenge. That's a, a, a tough, that's a difficult question to answer. I think that an educational program, uh, I'm not sure the treasury would be well equipped to, to fund that sort of thing. I think that maybe, obviously that depends on the proposal, so I'd have to, to judge specific proposals. It's hard to say that the, the DAO should or shouldn't do X before knowing what X is at the level of a political proposal. Uh, so, but I think maybe something similar to the Lambda School proposal of uh, training, uh, uh, training developers and then not receiving the rewards or, or, or receiving the, the receiving as payments a part of the, the developer's uh, salary, uh, an X percentage of developer salary. Maybe something like that could be imagined for the the DAO, I don't have any any more specific ideas than that. That's that's more of a shower thought for sure, and that's not at the level of a yeah. of a concrete idea. But maybe something like that, where you uh, where some group is going to try and train con future contractors or future developers, but is only going to receive the payment from the DAO after such developers themselves are, are getting paid. So maybe something like that. But that's, as I said, that's more of a shower thought than a, a concrete idea. Absolutely. And, and that's what Decred in Depth is for, is for those, those shower thoughts. Uh, this question, I know there's a lot of kind of misunderstanding and, and not being a super technical guy. I'm sorry if this sounds um, ignorant, but is smart contracts on Decred ever going to be a thing? And I, I know there's a lot of misunderstanding and misconception about exactly what is a smart contract. But if you can understand that question in a shower thought kind of way, uh, do you have an answer to that? Uh, so the pedantic answer is that that uh, smart contracts are already a thing in Decred because the, the script that, for example, allows us to spend from the treasury or add funds to the treasury. That's our smart contract already. Uh, the, the scripts that allow you to spend your regular coins are smart contracts. The, there are several advanced uses, uses for contracts. For example, Lightning Network is entirely based on having more complex smart contracts running in the network. So that's already a thing. Uh, uh, what people usually talk about when saying that Decred is not going to have smart contracts or should Decred have smart contracts is about Turing complete smart contracts. That is contracts, programs, software that allows you to do basically anything you want without bounds. And I really, really don't see that coming to Decred to the lowest level of the Decred blockchain. I, I really think that's not going to happen. And, and I'm, I just want to make sure for the audience, that's because it would create blockchain bloat, right? Exactly. Okay. So smart contracts 
are really hard to, to audit, are hard to evaluate. Uh, the, the concept of Turing completeness means that you can basically do uh, in, in a very high level, in a very high level way, you can basically do whatever you want. You can do as much with the smart contract as you can do with a regular computer. So it's really hard to, to, to set bounds for a contract. And if you are going to need bounds anyway, then you're, you don't necessarily need a theory complete contract. So PTLCs, for example, uh, allow, you, allow you to do off-chain contracts. You can bind uh, some, some very complex logic to revealing a specific uh, payment scalar, a specific private key. So you can do a lot of, of interesting applications or, or off-chain smart contracts once you have PTLCs in Lightning, for example. I'll have to do more research on, on PTLCs. Um, what problems do you see for Bitcoin that Decred can overcome because of governance? So, so this go back, goes back to one of the things that I said at the start, that having a formal way to come to an agreement, to, to having a formal way to make a decision on features or on conflicts is something that, uh, that I think is very valuable uh, when compared to, to Bitcoin's rough consensus. Uh, way of deciding things. I think there are there are cherry dots on, on both approaches, but I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of value in having a, a, a blockchain project that has a strict and formal method of, of solving conflicts, of solving governance conflicts in general. This question came from Twitter and it I think I understand what he, what's, what's being asked, but it's, it's kind of silly. Um, is Decred's governance process permissionless and able to withstand nation state interference? It's definitely permissionless because anyone can purchase a ticket. You don't have, you don't even need to use a VSP to purchase a ticket. Uh, that's just a, 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 an easier way to manage tickets using VSPs, but you can can do the, the blockchain itself is permissionless, so you can put up a node on the blockchain without having to to uh, to get a stamp of approval from from some entity. And, and in the same way, you can put up a, a voting wallet. You can purchase Decred in any way that you that you can come up with. You can purchase this in the market, or you can purchase this or you can mine it from uh, using a, a POW miner. So you can acquire coins in a permissionless way and you can vote in a permissionless way. So yes, it's definitely permissionless. Now, uh, if it's able to withstand uh, interfer interference from a nation, stand, a nation state, that's a uh, that's a tough question because it depends on what level of interference you you want to protect against. So we know that there are nation states that don't shy away from like poisoning their adversaries or or dropping bombs on on uh, their adversaries. So uh, that really depends on on how much you want to protect or, or how much you 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 were protected uh, there are obvious things that you can do to to uh, guard from that so for example uh, in case of a, a, a large stakeholder they can defend them, themselves by having multiple voting wallets in geographically distant uh, places they can vote via Tor to hide further hide where they are so there are, are several steps that you can do to improve your, your, uh, your interference uh, ability or the, the interference ability from third parties. But that's, that's on a spectrum. That's, there isn't a specific yes or yes or no. Are we 
uh, able to, to to defend ourselves. That that's definitely a spectrum. Absolutely. Um, this question comes from Ellie Herfey, who's been a long time contributor to um, my podcast and, and Decred community in general. He asks, he has this vision for Decred where he's able to open up Decrediton and he's able to just click a button and his Decred is allocated to a trustworthy VPN and it's added to a ticket splitting pool and all he did was click a button. Is this a daydream? Uh, so the, the existing uh Ticket splitting pool. Ticket splitting pool. It's not terribly far from that. So it's basically uh, a tool that you run. Uh, a small. Uh, you can run it on the command line, or you can run it on a, a GUI, a GUI. And it's a small tool that you run. You, you click a button, participate or join the the ticket splitting process. And then it's, it do, does its thing, and you come up with the, the tickets afterwards. So the only additional step on the existing tool is that you need to set it, you need to do a little bit of setup. You need to download, this, download it separately and run it separately from the wallet. So that would be uh, the only difference between his vision and what is possible today would be that. Uh, the the most important reason for not including the split ticket to in the credit on is because there are uh, there are concerns about voting amplification attacks, uh, specifically regarding uh, polite voting rights. So we need to do a consensus rule change to have a specific rule, voting key for polite rights when compared to on chain voting rights. There are some questions about uh, uh, how to, uh, there, there's an open problem about how to assign the, the voting rights, the on-chain voting rights in the tickets, because today I kind of the, the, I kind of cheat a little bit in that I generate every possible uh, ticket in a, in a pool, in a multi split ticket pool session. I generate every possible ticket for where each possible participant is voting and then just select one. And that's not great either. Uh, I need to have a, a cryptographic way of assigning the voting rights, which I don't have yet. Uh, and so there are some, some technical, low level technical problems for why the that tool hasn't been integrated in the credit on uh, just to and just to to give, give a little bit of context uh, a couple of weeks ago i ran an account and we on the block on the actual blockchain on the low level blockchain and we had in about two two years almost three years we had about two thousand seven hundred a little bit less than twenty seven hundred split tickets so there is a so we had an average of about 81 tickets that's an average of about 81 tickets split tickets a month so there is some demand for it uh, but even though it's not that much hard to, to purchase you, you just need to download uh, a second software and, and connect it to the existing wallet the demand the actual demand for pur purchasing the split tickets uh, wasn't that great and so, so that was a, another reason for why I didn't uh, devote so much time in bringing it up to speed on the new accountless VSP mode and integrating in the credit on. I have two more questions for you and then I'm going to let you go. This last or the second to last one just came in in the chat. What tips do you have for a beginner who wants to become a developer and, and, and maybe aspires to have some code merged one day in Decred? Uh, so I, I can only tell my own story. I can only uh, say that uh, for me at least it was uh, reasonably easy because uh, I started out contributing, contributing to the Crediton, which is mostly uh, HTML and, and CSS 
and JavaScript. So uh, in terms of, of uh, language knowledge, I already had it. And it was just a matter of, of uh, domain specific knowledge or, or decred specific knowledge or project specific knowledge. And the only way I, I, I know how to acquire that knowledge is to just do stuff. Just pick up, I, I picked up uh, an extended weekend. Uh, I tried to come up with uh, an interesting uh, thing to do. Some, some, I tried to come up with something that I wanted to have done, to, to something that I wanted that to be running on the credit on. And then I just tried to figure out steps that I needed to do to have that thing uh, oh, uh, running. So for example, the, one of the things that I wanted to do was to have a translation for the UI. I really wanted to get uh, the UI translated. So I just tried to backtrack from, from that. So if I wanna have a translated UI, which steps do I need to do? So I need to do this first and that first and that first. And then I picked the smallest thing that I could uh, figure out how to do. Also, the smallest thing was, for me specifically, was changing an icon on a certain screen that was showing up the wrong icon. And, and then I started from there. Just pick that, uh, fix that thing, set a PR, then I picked the next thing and set the PR, then I pick the next thing and set the PR, and then I just try to figure out what the next step is from where you are. I think that's great advice. Uh, this last question is an edited version of Alt Andy's question. Uh, again, another um, contributor to my podcast and I'll hopefully have a previous episode with him linked as well for people. Um, he says, pick three other crypto projects, I can't even name three other crypto projects, that have treasury and a governance, and how does Decred compare? Um, but I guess the edited version of that is, how does Decred compare to any other crypto projects that have treasuries and governance, in your opinion? And th that's, uh, that's a tough thing for me to, to answer as well. Uh, I, I don't know three projects in <laughs> enough depth to be able to answer that uh, with any sort of uh, balance or fairness, both to Decred and the other projects. Uh, but at least on a very high level, uh, I can see a lot of projects moving towards having sort of the same high level feature set that Decred has had since day one. So a lot of projects that started out following Bitcoin's funding model or an ICO funding model uh, are switching to using a treasury and many projects that uh, didn't uh, or were trying to emulate Bitcoin's rough consensus development model uh, switched or are switching or are testing out a way to have uh, proposals and, and budgets and reviews for for invoices and so on which is this sort of the same process that decred has had since day one uh, so so the general uh, feel that i have but this this is entirely uh, this is an opinion this is an opinion and obviously biased opinion uh, because i'm a decred developer is that uh, a lot of projects are sort of converging on Decred's model for for development for development. So even even Bitcoin, we see a lot of stuff like trying to come up with independent uh, funds uh, or independent entities to fund Bitcoin development, and that sort of sort of resembles or sort of I can say it's inspired because I don't know. As I said, I don't know them enough uh, in detail to, to say they were inspired by Decred, but, but they certainly resonate or certainly resemble the Decred model. I, I think that's a very fair assessment. Uh, Mateus, um, someone just referred to as the, the Lightning King. I like that. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, 
any anything else that you'd like to leave with the audience um, before we end? Yeah, uh, so there there's one thing that we didn't address in the in all the treasury talk, which is the the safety of the treasury funds, uh, and it's very important for stakeholders since the stakeholder stakeholders are going to to have to come up with a decision on whether to approve or not the decentralized uh, the decentralization of the treasury as it, it exists in the co current version of the code so one thing we didn't address is that uh, the funds for the treasury they are protected not not only by the the voting itself but there are several restrictions uh, about how to spend funds from the the treasury so the 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 spending funds from the treasury can only happen on the special treasury spend transactions these transactions need to be signed by polite by special polite keys so only uh, a few people can create valid treasury spend transactions after that the the these transactions need to be voted and there's a limit of seven transactions per vote so there is a hard limit on how many uh, t spend transactions are being voted at any given time uh, and there there's also limits on how much the treasury how much each individual treasury spend can can spend from the treasury uh, and how much the how much the set of all treasury spend transactions can spend from the treasury within a given uh, window with within a given uh, policy windows which is about a month if i'm not mistaken uh, so the so all the treasury spends for a given uh, policy window can only spend up to 150 percent of the previous window so for example if we spend a uh, thousand this year now we can only spend 1500 this year on next month so that we can ensure that the treasury isn't drained from funds from for example a, a, a mistaken uh, t spend or if the t spend key is somehow hacked or stolen or even if the owner of the the treasury the politea keys tries to uh, generate a t spend transaction that spends all of the funds to themselves for example uh, there are low level consensus rules that prevent such uh, large uh, withdrawals from the treasury so so there are a lot of protections in place to prevent the the treasury from being uh, completely defunded thank you for that um is there anything else that i missed that you think needs to be addressed for the the stakeholders to know in regards to the consensus changes uh i think that's that that's the the gist of it obviously there are a lot of low level details for how uh, voting takes place there and there for how votes are accounted for uh, there are a lot of, of very uh, very small details and very very intricate details on the consensus rules but that's just the nature of the of consensus works consensus work absolutely well i i want to thank you for your time um to everyone watching, thank you all for tuning in. If, if you don't think there's anything else, uh, we will end the stream here. Uh, Mateus De Giovanni, thank you very much. Thank you for having me uh, and thank you for the audience. And obviously, uh, if there are any additional questions, we can answer on the chats or, or via any other methods or on Twitter and so on. Absolutely. Thank you guys for tuning in.